So I'm just back from my holidays down in Cork, and uh, I'm from Tipperary. So Tipperary is a landlocked county, for any of you who aren't from Tipperary. We have no sea. We're, we're deprived. We're sealess. Uh, so I love, I love the beach. I love the sea. Um, my sister lives in Port Marnock in Dublin as well, so every time I go there, I just, just, just walk on the beach and just kind of sit there, kind of dozily looking out. It's just beautiful. It really is beautiful. So I was in um, uh, Inchidani and, and Ross Garbery then, uh, the day before yesterday. And I decided I'd go out a little later and watch, watch the sunset, all romantic, just me and my dog. And uh, it, was, it was just really, really, really beautiful. So you had a kind of s small bit of mist, crashing waves, just beating the, 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 quite the, the, the steep shelf where I was. And, uh, and then this pinky, orangey sunset going on and the dog running around looking for a ball or something. Uh, and it just struck me how... Um, how beautiful the sea is. It's kind of, it's kind of I think, I'm, maybe I'm the only one, I don't know. Maybe, I, I find it kind of magnetic. I think, and even if you look at most, well, most cultures, most big cities are built on either a big river or the sea, that was probably more due to transportation and that, but I think it, there, there's something very beautiful about it as well. We're kind of drawn to the sea. Uh, it's fascinating, it's beautiful. And at the same time, you have to respect it, right? One of the days, I was out on my wee kayak in the bay, and I mean, I'm, again, from Tipperary, so I don't know much about the sea, but I, hopefully I have a bit of cop on. When you see the waves come in, obviously you don't want to get caught between the waves and the rocks, so you try and keep well away from the rocks, and if the wave does catch you a little, you know, you're not going to get hit off the rocks. So you have to be very, very careful. Um, and that's only at, at where I was, if it was even three metres deep. I mean, I couldn't touch the bottom, but like, it, I wasn't way out to, to, to sea or anything. But I can only imagine like, for people who live on the sea or for, for fishermen, like, I mean, you have, to, you have to have such respect for the sea. Because it, it it's stunningly beautiful. But it's kind of dangerous. <laughs> it's beautiful, but, but you have to have respect for it, or it can really come back to bite you. And I'm sure all fishing villages, like they all have, normally there's a plaque somewhere dedicated to all those who lost their lives over the years fishing. And I was reading this gospel thinking, um, what on earth does the Lord want me to say about it and how, how did this, 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 this beauty of the sea thing was in my mind the last couple of days and I thought, how on earth does this tie in with today's gospel? Peter is obviously, he's going to be the first, first pope, he doesn't know that yet. Uh, he's going to be a pope, a saint, he's going to be a bishop, effectively. Um, and he gets some things very, very right, right? So when, who do people say I am? Who do people say I am? And he says, you're the Christ. Like that's, that, that's, that's an incredible statement because the people of Israel, the Hebrews, had, the Jews had been waiting for eons for this Messiah. And the prophets speak about him, this Messiah who will come and this, this uh, great redeemer who will restore the land to Israel and so on. Like they, they've been speaking about it for centuries. To say now, like to the guy in front of you, you are the Messiah. That's huge, huge, a huge statement. And Jesus responds, like, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for it was not flesh and blood that revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Okay, so, so he's been kind of, you can imagine Peter being, feeling fairly chuffed about himself. You know, Jesus just said, I'm blessed. You know I mean, just feeling pretty good about myself. Then Jesus says, um, begins to teach that he's going to suffer grievously. He's going to be taken, he's going to be hated, and he's going to be killed and put to death. And Peter, typical Peter, wants to kind of step in and defend him and says, Lord, this must not be so. If you're going to go to Jerusalem and be killed, but then you must not go to Jerusalem, I will protect you. And a couple of sentences beforehand, he's lifted so high. And then the Lord responds, get behind me, Satan, for the way you think is not God's way, but man's. Okay. So Peter shows us in two sentences that you can get things very, very right, and you can get, uh, you can get things very, very wrong. A bishop can get, can get things very, very right and very, very wrong. A priest can get things very right and something's very, very wrong. So it's kind of like the sea, right? The, the sea is like the faith. It's something very, very beautiful, right? It's, it's, it's incredible. It's fascinating. It's full of life. But there's a responsibility about the sea as well. You have to be careful with the sea right? With the faith. It's, it's beautiful. It's life-giving. It really, really, really is. But if we get it wrong, it goes seriously wrong. If you get it wrong, you can hurt people. And especially as priests. If I were to give advice now to my seafaring folk 
that ends them up on the rocks. That's my fault, you know, because of my bad advice. So the, the, it's beautiful, but there's a responsibility there for us priests, especially. So I was just thinking how important it is for, for us as a for, for me as a priest, for us as priests, to be good shepherds. But there's another interesting thing I heard. I heard two stories recently, which I found fascinating. Um, one guy had a bit of, bit of tension in his chest, right? So he goes to the doctor, and um, the doctor has a, a kind of look, basically looks him up and down and says, here's some cough bottle. You'll t take that now twice a day. It'll be grand. Okay, so the tension started to build and build and build. I think it was a family member who eventually brought him into A&E, and he was admitted to hospital with that close to heart failure. Okay? And then the family said to him, okay, you, obviously you're not going back to that doctor. Ah, sure, I've always gone to him. But he's a useless doctor. <laughs> he could have killed you. You know, I heard another story, something similar. There was a, um, a, a guy who was just talking about how his sister was grievously ill, misdiagnosed, undiagnosed, went to see a doctor, undiagnosed, and actually, actually died. Right? Um, but the, the, the granny continues to go, to, ah, granny, granny. but like, the doctor has proven himself over and over again to be incompetent, just not a good doctor. Now, again, the family looking on going, why do you keep going to him? I don't know if it's, a, if it's, if it's some sort of misguided loyalty or something. I'm not quite sure what the reason is. But generally speaking, if a doctor isn't a good doctor, you stop going and get another one. There's a, a restaurant, a family I heard going to a restaurant recently, and they all came back with food poisoning. I shall not name it. I'm tempted. No, I'm not. Um, but they came back, with, the whole family came down with food poisoning. Like just the whole, imagine the whole family like the same time. Very unpleasant, okay? So obviously you don't go back to that restaurant. With, with ordinary things like that, we, you know, if you get scammed buying a car for a, a garage, uh, some dealer or something, and it doesn't go well for you, okay? Well, you don't go back there. You know, ah, should we give him a second chance? <laughs> Generally speaking, you don't, okay? So when it comes to fairly unimportant things, uh, we learn quickly from, from those kind of mistakes. When it comes to our, our spiritual life, we, we have to, as such, demand the best. And what's interesting is, we, we've, generally speaking in Ireland, we've had a, a very a wonderful loyalty to the local parish, which is, which is good. Um, but there's something deeper, I think, that we, we require now. I think we have to go where we're fed. Not just to the local parish, not to the parish we've always gone to, not to the parish where you know, my father paid for the, the front bench or the, his, you know, my great-great-grandfather has his name under the, one of the same glass windows. That's the church we've always gone to. That's the church I'll always go to. Not, not really. I think that that, that kind of has to stop, if I'm honest. I think we have to go where we're fed. If you're going to a church and it's, if, if Mass is superficially celebrated, and I'm sorry to say that, but if Mass is celebrated superficially and just kind of get it over with as quickly as possible, like a dental appointment, that's not nourishing for your soul, even though you receive Holy Communion. Because it's Holy Community even is presented to us in such a kind of a superficial way, it actually damages our faith, or it'll damage the faith of our children. So we actually have to go where we're fed, because just because we're priests, we can still get it wrong. Peter gets it so right and gets it so wrong. If, if, if we know there's a local priest who's fairly consistent at not getting it right, go somewhere else. Because there's another issue here in that if, if a priest is trying to be a good priest, he will lose people. This is, um, you know, I, 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 have, I have plenty of, of, of good priest friends, and if you try to raise the bar, if a priest tries to raise the bar, he will lose people. And then the other priest will look on and go, ah, there you go. You know what I mean? You're preaching too long, or you're, you know, you're preaching about the, you're actually preaching about the gospel. What are you doing? You should be preaching about hurling. Um, you know, you're, so you're actually, trying to, you're actually trying to give some spiritual nourishment. People will leave because they'll go for a quicker mass somewhere else. So we have to support the good shepherds. We, that's in all of us, we have to support the good shepherds. If there's a good priest near you, or even if it's a good priest who's not exactly near you, but they provide spiritual nourishment, they celebrate mass well, support them, support them. And if I could phrase it negatively, don't support those who don't feed you. Does because then why would they change? We need to see like, that, that they're being seafaring folk. We have to be responsible. Being priests, we have to be responsible. 
we have to be responsible for the souls entrusted to us. Like, and if, if we're not nourishing them, we should see that they go somewhere else. The danger in Ireland is the quicker Mass you celebrate, the larger congregation you'll have, but it's all superficial. As soon as there's a lockdown, I wonder if, there, if those people will come back at all. Because if, if our goal is always the minimum, the minimum, the minimum amount of faith, the minimum amount of time, the minimum amount of prayer, it doesn't take much to knock you off altogether. Your heart was never in it. Whereas if we're looking for more, and looking to be fed, and looking to understand the gospel, looking to be nourished by the word, looking to be nourished, nourished by the Holy Communion, by, by the Holy Eucharist, that's, something, that's a different level of faith altogether. So we should demand the best and support our good shepherds and go where we're fed. So we ask the good Lord today to renew our church, to help us all to see the beauty of our faith, the beauty of the gospel, and the beauty of a lived relationship with Jesus. Amen.